Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Prinsi Chahar, research scholar from Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. Today we are going to discuss about a module, Female Feticide, under paper, Women and Law, under the discipline, Women's Studies. First of all, I would like to tell you the objectives of the module. The main objective of the module is to highlight the crime of female feticide. Another objective of the module is to make the reader aware of the laws that prohibit medical determination of sex of the unborn fetus and prescribed penalties for the same. Under the module, we will learn about the important legislative provisions prohibiting prenatal sex determination and we will also sensitize the people about the evil effects of female feticide. Female feticide is one of the most heinous crime committed against humanity in general and against womanhood in particular. The craving for a male child coupled with the family planning programs, insistence on small family norms and the evil of dowry system all have created a situation wherein birth of a daughter is sought to be avoided at all costs, which in turn leads people to commit the most horrifying of all crimes wherein a girl child is murdered in her mother's womb. Now, we must know what, does we, what is female feticide. So, female feticide implies expulsion of the female fetus from the mother's womb. Now, what is Fetus. Fetus has been defined under Section 4, Clause 1, Subclause BC of Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques, Regulations and Prevention of Misuse Amendment Rules 2002 as a human organism during the period of its development beginning on the 57th day following fertilization or creation and ending at birth. So, female feticide means killing of a female fetus in the mother's womb. Now, let us discuss the development of law on female feticide. The earliest law on this problem is Regulation 6 of 1802 followed by the Female Infanticide Act 1864 which was passed by the Britishers to curb the then prevalent practice of infanticide by declaring it equivalent to willful murder. Today, female feticide has appeared in place of female infanticide, thereby hastening the pace of the death of a female child from the born to the unborn stage. In 1964, the Ministry of Health set up Sashanti Lal Shah Committee to look into the human rights issues of reproductive rights of women wherein they were claiming legalization of abortions. In the year 1971, the parliament enacted the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act 1971, which came into force from 1st April 1972 and was subsequently revised in the year 1975 and 2002 by Medical Termination of Pregnancy Amendment Act. The act was passed with an objective to avoid the misuse of induced abortions. This act recognizes a woman's right to privacy, her right to limit her pregnancies, her right to produce healthy babies and gives her the freedom to take decisions with respect to her own body. But this right is being misused by people to selectively get female fetuses aborted. In 1980s, Large-scale female feticide was detected in Maharashtra, so the state government banned amniocentesis by the Maharashtra Regulation of Use of Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Act in 1987. Article 21 of the Constitution of India reinforces right to life. Article 51 AE 
also provides for renouncing of practice derogatory to the status of women. In the light of all these, the Parliament of India enacted the Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques, Regulation and Prevention of Misuse Act 1994 for preventing misuse of technology to determine prenatal sex leading to female feticide. In December 2002, the PNDT Act was further amended to overcome lacuna in existing law and to check the illegal practice of female feticide. The Act was subsequently titled as the Preconception and the Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Prohibition of Sex Selection Act. Thereafter, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare notified the Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Regulation and Prevention of Misuse Amendment Rules 2003, thereby substituting the 1996 rules with the new rules on 14 February 2003. So now I will let you know the list of all laws that we have on female feticide. The first law that we have is Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act 1971. Then came Medical Termination of Pregnancy Amendment Act 2002. Then we have Maharashtra Regulation of Use of Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Act 1987. Another important law on female feticide is Preconception and Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Act 1994 and latest is the Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Regulation and Prevention of Misuse Amendment Rules 2003. Apart from that, there are few sections under Indian Penal Code 1860 which comprehensively covers offences of feticide and infanticide. These are Section 312 to Section 318 of IPC. This section covers offences of causing miscarriage, preventing the child from being born, causing death of unborn child, abandoning the newborn child, concealing the body or secretly disposing it of. Though the words feticide and infanticide have not been specifically used under these chapters or under these sections, Nevertheless, these sections cover both of them. Now, I would like to discuss with you some important provisions of Preconception and Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Act 1994. But before discussing the important provisions, we must know the objective of the Act. The first objective of Preconception and Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Act is to regulate the prenatal diagnostic techniques for the purpose of detecting genetic and metabolic disorders and chromosomal abnormalities and sex-linked disorders. Second objective of the act is to prevent the misuse of such techniques for the purpose of detection and determination of preconception and prenatal sex of fetus leading to female feticide. Another important objective of the act is to ensure the effective implementation of it at all levels. Now let us discuss some important provisions of the act. After discussing the objectives of PCPNDT Act, now I would like to discuss with you some important provisions of the Act. One important provision of the Act is provided under Section 4 of the PCPNDT Act, which says, which talks about regulation of prenatal diagnostic techniques. According to this section, prenatal diagnostic techniques are allowed only for the purpose of detection of chromosomal abnormalities, genetic metabolic diseases, sex-linked genetic diseases, congenital anomalies, hemoglobinothesis, or any other abnormalities or diseases as may be specified by the Central Advisory Board. Moreover, these techniques can be used only in cases when either the age of the pregnant woman is above 35 years of age, she is above 35 years of age, or when the pregnant woman has undergone two or more spontaneous abortions or fetal loss, or when the pregnant woman has been exposed to potentially tetratogenic agents such as 
drugs, radiations, infections or chemicals. Or when the pregnant woman or her spouse has a medical history of mental retardation or physical deformities or they are suffering from any other genetic disease or any other condition which may be specified by central advisory board. If these conditions are not there, then prenatal test cannot be conducted on a woman. These techniques, these prenatal techniques can be used only by the registered practitioner having prescribed qualification at a registered place only. Rule 19 clause 4 requires that registration certificate in form B shall be prominently displayed by the genetic counseling centers, genetic laboratories and, and clinics. Moreover, an important provision under the act is this that the person conducting the prenatal test shall not communicate the sex of the fetus to the pregnant woman or her relative either by words or sign or in any other manner whatsoever. So, no written communication, no communication by way of words or signs or signs should be made. Rule 17 clause 1 provides that every genetic counseling center or clinic or laboratory has to display prominently in its premises a notice in English and in local language for the information of the public that disclosure of the sex of the fetus is prohibited under the law. Section 20 of the Act provides that appropriate authority may sue motto or on the basis of any complaint received against any such laboratory, clinic, center may issue a show cause notice to them and ask why its registration should not be suspended or cancelled on the ground of reasons mentioned in the notice. And after giving an opportunity of being heard to such laboratory, clinic or centre, the appropriate authority may suspend or even cancel its registration. Apart from that, Section 21 also provides that such laboratory, clinic or centre may within a period of 30 days from the date of receiving of order of suspension or cancellation may appeal to a central advisory authority or the state advisory authority as the case may be. Section 22 of PCPNDT Act prohibits any person, laboratory, clinic, center to issue, publish, distribute and communicate any advertisement in any form including internet regarding facility of prenatal determination of sex or sex selection before conception available in such places. Any person who contravenes the provisions of section 22 shall be punished with an imprisonment which may extend to 3 years or with fine which may extend to 2000 rupees. According to rule 10 1a, any person conducting ultrasonography or image scanning on pregnant women shall give a declaration on each report that he or she has neither detected nor disclosed the sex of the fetus to anybody. Pregnant women is also required to declare that she does not want to know the sex of her fetus before undergoing ultrasonography and image scanning. Section 24 of the Act states that if a prenatal test is conducted, it shall be presumed that the woman is compelled by her husband or other relatives to undergo prenatal diagnostic techniques for the purpose other than the purposes for which use of such techniques are permitted under the Act. And such person shall be liable for abatement of offence as per Section 23 of the Act. Section 27 of the Act clearly states that every offence under this Act shall be cognizable, non bailable and non compoundable Section 28 provides that the court shall take cognizance of a case under this Act on a complaint made to it by appropriate authority concerned or by a person authorized in this behalf by central or the state government or appropriate authority and 
on a complaint of a person who has given at least 15 days notice to the appropriate authority of the alleged offence and his intention to make a complaint to the court. The complaint shall be heard only in the court of a metropolitan magistrate or the judicial magistrate of first class. Section 30 of the Act gives appropriate authority, power of search and seizure. According to it, if appropriate authority has reason to believe that an offence has been committed under this Act at any genetic laboratory, clinic or centre or any other place, then the authority or any authorised officer of it may enter, search and examine any record, register, document, book, pamphlet, advertisement or any other material object found therein. The Act also provides protection to central government, state government and appropriate authority under Section 31 for anything done by them in good faith in pursuance of the provisions of this Act. Now we will discuss about informed consent. What is informed consent? Means taking consent of the women which should be in writing. So according to Section 5 of the Act, the person who is conducting the prenatal test, he has to take the written consent of the pregnant women and he is also bound to explain her all the known side and after effects of the procedure. Such prenatal tests must have some side effects or some known effects on the health of a woman. Therefore, it is a duty bound of the person who is taking the prenatal test, who is doing the prenatal test to inform the pregnant women all the side effects, all the after effects of the procedure which is known to him. Moreover, a copy of the consent of the women should be given to the women. The Act imposes a ban on the determination of the sex of the fetus under Section 6. According to Section 6 of the Act, no person or genetic counselling centre or genetic laboratory or genetic clinic shall conduct any prenatal diagnostic techniques including ultrasonography for the determination of the sex of the fetus. Therefore, determination of the sex of the fetus by using any of the prenatal diagnostic techniques is strictly prohibited under the Act. Now, let us discuss the take of judiciary on the issue of female feticide. In response to a public interest litigation filed by Centre for Inquiry into Health and Allied Themes, that is CEHAT, which is a research centre of Anusandhan Trust based in Pune and Mumbai, Mahila Sarveen Utkarsh Mandal based in Pune and Maharashtra, and Dr. Sabu M. George, who is having experience and technical knowledge in the field of urging effective implementation of PNDT Act, the Supreme Court passed an order on 4th May 2001, which is reported in AIR 2001, Supreme Court 2007, in which Honorable Supreme Court directed the authorities to ensure implementation of the Act and plug its loopholes. The same petitioner again filed a writ petition number 301 of 2000. In this petition, it was inter alia prayed that as the prenatal diagnostic techniques contravene the provisions of PNDT Act, the central government and the state government be directed to implement the provisions of PNDT Act number 1 by appointing appropriate authorities at state and district levels and the advisory committees. Number two, the central government was directed to ensure that central supervisory board meets every six months as provided under the PNDT Act. And thirdly, for banning of all the advertisements of prenatal sex selection, including all other sex determination techniques, which can be abused to selectively produce only boys either before or during pregnancy. On September 10, 2003, Justice M.B. Shaha and Ashok Ban of the Supreme Court, while delivering their judgment on the above issue, observed, it is unfortunate that for one reason or the other, the practice of female infanticide still prevails, despite the fact that 
gentle touch of her daughter and her voice has soothing effect on the parents one of the reasons may be the marriage problems faced by the parents coupled with the dowry demand by the so called educated and rich persons who are well placed in the society the traditional system of female infanticide whereby female baby was done away with after birth by poisoning or letting her choke on husk continues in a different form by taking advantage of advanced medical techniques unfortunately developed medical science is misused to get rid of a girl child before birth knowing full well that is the science that is immoral or unethical as well as it may amount to offense fetus of a girl child is aborted by qualified and unqualified doctors or compounders This has affected overall sex ratio in various states where female infanticide is prevailing without any hindrance. In this case, the court also directed that the Central Supervisory Board has to examine the necessity of amending this act in order to remove difficulties in its implementation and make it more equipped to deal with the present and future technological advancements. Direction stated that appropriate authority should be appointed at district and sub district levels and the list of the members appointed should be published in the print and the electronic media these authorities were required to send quarterly reports to the central supervisory boards and in general directions were given to spread awareness against the practice of prenatal sex determination and the hazards associated with it the supreme court directed the state government to take further steps to enforce the law and the department of family welfare was directed to file an affidavit indicating the status of action taken supreme court directed nine companies to supply the information of the machines sold to various clinics in the last 5 years details of about 11200 machines from all these companies were collected and fed into a common database Addresses received from the manufacturers were also sent to concerned states to launch prosecution against those bodies who were using ultrasound machines without getting themselves registered under the act. The court directed that the ultrasound machines or the scanners may be sealed and seized if they were being used without registration. the indian medical association the indian Radio- radiologist association and the federation of obstetrician and gynecologist societies of india were asked to punish details of members using these machines other than this case there is a landmark case in the year 2008 in the name of vijay kumar sharma versus union of india in this case it was held that the provisions of preconception and prenatal diagnostic techniques acts that is pcpndt acts are clear unambiguous and in time with their approved object in the year 2005 there was a case of vinod soni versus union of india in which the constitutional validity of pcpndt act was challenged the bombay high court in this case held that every child has a right to full development therefore a child conceived also has a right to full development under article 21 of the constitution of india the court also held that right to personal liberty does not include the right to choose the sex of the offspring as liberty cannot be expanded to prohibit a fetus coming into existence as it is for the nature to decide so we can say that yes judiciary has taken initiatives and has done a lot in order to prevent the menace of female feticide now let us discuss the penal provisions which are there in the act in cases of contravention of the provisions of any law made under the act and the rules if any medical geneticist gynecologist or registered medical practitioner or any other person who owns or who is employed in any genetic counseling center laboratory or clinic contravenes the provisions of this act or rules made there under then he or she shall be liable to punishment with an imprisonment which may extend to 3 years and with fine which may extend to 10000 rupees 
and in case if they repeat the offence then for the subsequent offence they will be liable for punishment with an imprisonment which may extend to 5 years and a fine which may extend to 50,000 rupees. Apart from that, the appropriate authority has a duty to report the name of such registered medical practitioner who has contravened the provisions of the Act to the concerned State Medical Council for taking the necessary actions. Then, such practitioner shall remain suspended till the case against him is completely disposed of if the charges are framed against him. If no charges are framed, then his license will not be suspended. But if charges are framed against him, then he will his license will remain suspended. When a medical practitioner is found guilty after a due inquiry, his name shall be removed from the register of concerned medical counsel for a period of five years and in case of a subsequent offence, his name will be removed permanently. Government of India has also taken few steps in order to curb the evil of female feticide. Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi launched two schemes namely Beti Bachao Beti Parhao and Sukanya Samridhi account on 22nd of January 2015 in a bid to encourage the birth and education of girl child. Beti Bachao Beti Parhao scheme. This scheme has been started with 100 crore corpus fund at initial level. Now what are the main objectives of Beti Bachao Beti Parhao scheme? The first objective of this scheme is to prevent female infanticide and female feticide. The, another objective of the scheme is to ensure that every girl child is protected and to ensure that every girl child is educated. There are various targets under this scheme. The initial focus of this scheme will be on 100 districts which has low sex ratio. At least one district is covered from each state. Initially, 12 districts have been chosen from Haryana where the child sex ratio is dismally low around 875 females per 1000 males. Another target of the scheme is to improve the sex ratio by 10 points in 100 districts in a year. That is 10 more girls per 1000 babies born. Moreover, another target of the scheme is to increase the number of girls in secondary school by 79 percent up to 2017 which the government could not achieve. More action plans are to build separate toilets for girls in secondary and primary schools, open 50 more Kasturba Gandhi Bal Vidhalaya by 2015 to celebrate Girl Child Day on 24th of January. Action plans under the schemes are that a reward of 1 crore will be given for the innovative village which attains a balanced sex ratio. Another action plan is to promote early registration of pregnancy and institutional delivery, to hold panchayat responsible for child marriage and to create a parliamentary forum of MPs representing 100 districts. These were the important points of Beti Bachao Beti Parhao Yojana. Apart from that, the government has also started Sukanya Samriddhi account. Now, what is Sukanya Samriddhi account? This account scheme has been proposed to start a special small savings scheme for the education of girl child. Under the scheme, accounts of the girls can be open from their birth till they attain the age of 10 years. The account can be opened with a minimum amount of 1000 rupees and an amount up to 150,000 rupees may be deposited into it in a financial year. Investments made under the scheme are also exempted from tax under Section 80C of Income Tax Act 1961. Therefore, they will not be liable to pay income tax on the deposits made under this scheme. Government will provide interest at the rate of 9.1% for the saving account. And 50% of the money 
in this account can be withdrawn by the girl child after attaining 18 years of age. The account will remain operative till she attains the age of 21 years. So these are the initiatives taken by the government of India in order to protect girl child in order in a bit to encourage the birth and education of a girl child. After going through with all the provisions, definitions and government initiatives on female feticide, we can conclude that the impact of large-scale female feticide in the past three decades is already manifesting itself in the form of a skewed sex ratio and lack of rights for boys of marriageable ages. More generally, demographers warn that in the next 20 years, as the number of marriageable women declines, men would tend to marry younger women, leading to a rise in fertility rates and thus a rate, high rate of population growth. The abduction of girls is an associated phenomenon. A society with a preponderance of unmarried young men is prone to particular dangers. More women are likely to be exploited as sex workers. Increases in molestations and rape are an obvious result. The sharp rise in sex crimes in the last two decades have been attributed to the unequal sex ratio. Though legislations have been drafted, yet we need to do something more in order to curb the menace of female feticide. The dwindling sex ratio need to be balanced and this can be done only when the state, the media, journalists, non-government organizations, medical practitioners, women group and the public themselves take concrete steps to ensure that the provisions of anti-female feticide laws are implemented fully and effectively. Yeah, it is difficult to eradicate social evils with the help of legislation alone. So, there is an urgent need to sensitize the general public in order to curb the practices discriminatory against and derogatory to the dignity of women. Thank you.